Antonin turned his face into the wind again, welcoming the chill, the numbing cold. He wanted it to cool his fury, to cut into the heart of him and freeze the passions that seethed there. He wanted to be numb. The cold had turned even the turbulent sea into still and silent ice. Now let it conquer the turbulence with unbanked Antonin. He opened his mouth, exhaled a long plume of breath that rose from his reddened cheeks like steam, inhaled a drought of frigid air that went down like liquid oxygen. But panic came in the wake of that thought. Again! It was happening again! What was liquid oxygen? Cold, he knew, somehow. Colder than the ice, colder than this wind. Liquid oxygen was bitter and white, and it steamed and flowed. He knew it, knew it as certainly as he knew his known name. But how? Can destiny be delayed, dear viewers? Can its cause be changed? Robert Gibson, XJ, and I, your humble servants, Nikita Zuev, will debate this and many more things as we discuss Under Siege by George R. R. Martin. This is the third tale that we have looked at by this prolific author uh, as we slowly journey through his extensive body of work. Who knows, perhaps one day we will tackle A Song of Ice and Fire. But for that to happen, Mr. Uh, Mr. Martin must finish the Shaga first. Under Siege was published in 1985 and then re-released in uh, Dream Songs, Volume 2, which is right here. Um, my copy, right here. At first, uh, the, uh, the narrative uh, is akin to historical fiction, as we are placed in 1808, at the time of the Dano-Swedish conflict. Slowly, uh, though, the story reveals to us that the actual setting of its action is in a distant dystopian future, from which our nameless protagonist travels through time to change the terrible outcome of their reality. Besides introducing a fascinating way to travel through time via copious uh, <clears throat> via consciousness rather than physicality, uh, the work also deals with the entire spectrum of human emotions, as our protagonist is brought to the brink of despair by his circumstances, both in the past and in his gloomy present. In only uh, about 30 pages, Martin brings uh, a cast of characters to life, introduces us to their plights, and delivers a mind-boggling ending filled with hidden meanings, as our author often does. That's uh, Under Siege, without much spoilers, as you probably have recognized, and we will spoil the tale as we will talk about it. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's pretty uh, late in, um, in the cycle of George R. R. Martin writing, right? Like, we're coming closer and closer towards uh, his, uh, what many would consider his masterpiece, right? The five books that are currently out of A Song of Ice and Fire, and the two that are still to be made if ever to be released. And yeah, let's let's just uh, talk about Under Siege uh, first, and then we can maybe do, delve further into what implications this work may have for his uh, future possible writing. Robert, what did you think of Under Siege? First of all, I, I think this story for me was rescued by the ending. I'm not saying the earlier parts weren't good, but... I really wanted some sort of twist at the end, and that's what the author gave, fortunately. And he's, his character was faced with a choice between alternatives, both of which he rejected, and he ended up with a third option thought up by himself, and that was really satisfying. I don't know if I dare spoil it, but... The to some extent I'll spoil it simply by saying that he does change history, but not in the way in which he was ordered to do, and uh, that was uh, very effective. Also, it's not overdone as far as the implications are concerned. The reader is invited to study those for himself. 
Yeah, to to unveil a little bit uh, out of the way, so the people underst- uh, the, that haven't read it but still want to listen understand. Um, our nameless protagonist is part of a mutant uh, uh, squad, which is sent into the past through um, being locked in. Uh, deprivation tanks filled with liquid oxygen and some other strange psychic phenomena um and they are all being sent to do the same mission and that is prevent from ussr from existing to make sure that the future that they are currently living in cannot happen which is a dystopian nuclear wasteland from what it seems at least and they're all being sent to different places. One of them is sent to to the time of the, uh, you know, Ivan the Terrible. You know, another is somewhere, you know, running around during the Napoleon Wars. Um, and on, you know, uh, our dwarf, let's just say our our, our little mutant, uh, he uh, he's been sent to um, eighteen oh eight during uh, a clash. Uh, between Norway, Sweden, France, and Russia. And um, there's this fortress that the, the Russians are about to take, and the protagonist is trying to make sure that the, <clears throat> the fortress does not surrender. Right? Um, and so most of the story is, is sort of like jumping back and forth between, between those two situations. And... When we finally get to the resolution, there's no turning back, right? So the protagonist is sort of faced with, I either do this exactly like I was told to do it, or I, um, you know, or I try to change uh, the world differently. And, oh, Robert, I think you're, you're being called to the Council of All Brits at this very moment. And he's off. Um, right, so... Now that Robert has turned his back and I can talk about... Oh, never mind. He's, he's back. I, I will never get to say the words that I wanted to. How unfortunate. No. Um, so what's, what's fascinating to me about the end of the story, um, which is funny funny way to start the analysis by the end, uh, is the fact that throughout um, the tale, we can see how unsatisfied our character is with his existence. Yet... He is never really shown to be a go-getter, as somebody who would make a leap of faith. He is somebody who who is pretty easily manipulated um, by the by the fe- female scientist. I forget her name. Um, into into making the choices she wanted Ronnie, him to I make. Believe. Ronnie, uh, thank uh, you very short, much. Shortened to Ronnie. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So she's she's a master at manipulating him. And I don't think he realizes it even by the end of the tale, but he he seems to have a syndrome um, where he he believes that his existence is just so uh, sour that nothing good could ever come of it. Um, so perhaps realizing that there is no going back to that existence is what really emboldens him to make that choice and start creating a different future. Right with with his own means, um, I think that's an interesting debate to to really have. What you know, why exactly our nameless um, nameless friend made the decision that he did. But overall, uh, you would say you enjoyed the story, Robert. Yeah, I'm glad I I'm glad I read it. Um, I mm-hmm. I get a bit weary of the modern way of writing stories which is to put a lot of yuck in them but by and large <laughs> i think it was uh, it was a good so, story wait wait put a lot of yuck in them what yeah. do you mean by that well it's just it's just reflecting the society we live in but it's not particularly the author's fault um so yeah i i, I i'm going to give it quite a high score uh, I, I think... <laughs> we're already at scores ladies and gentlemen it's, it's over you can turn off the podcast now yeah no sorry go on what were you gonna say i just want to say uh it's quite ironical i think the more i think about it that <clears throat> although the the object is to prevent the ussr from existing the last sentence or two suggests that it might have actually prevented 
the USA, at least in its present form, from existing. Because if Fremont rather than Buchanan becomes president in 1856, there's no guarantee that uh, someone like Lincoln will ever become president in 1860, and there's no guarantee that the country won't split up and the North America won't get balkanized, as it were. So although there may be a, a small USA it cons consisting of a few states, there might not be a rival to uh, the USSR, and that would be another way of ensuring that the disastrous nuclear Armageddon does not happen. Yeah, it's that's that's very true, right? And when you when you read those words at first, you kind of think, okay, well, what is he trying to do? Let's analyze what our protagonist is is doing. And yeah, I think that's actually the only real way to to take that ending um, in its fullness. I think that's what George R. R. Martin is suggesting that well, the uh, the squad of mutants has failed to do the task of uh, destroying Russia. Uh, as have you know, thousands of years of history also tried to do. Um, so maybe let's get rid of something that existed for not as long a time, right? And let's see if that would be easier for us um, to to prevent the disaster, right? It's a very thought provoking thing. It's also like um, you know the the teachings of um, a very strange, um, brutal pacifism, right? The idea like well. The only way that there will not be war is if we don't fight at all. So why don't we just surrender completely, right? Um, an interesting, thought-provoking message. Uh, whether or not it works in real life, I'll, I'll leave that up to philosophers. But there you go. Uh, actually, what about you? How did you feel about Under Siege? Right. So first of all, I need to apologize to our listeners because I am just coming out of a cold and uh, my thoughts are probably going to be scattered um, and my voice hoarse. Uh, with that out of the way, I quite enjoyed this story far and above uh, all the other stories, I've short stories that we have uh, explored from Josh R. R. Martin. Uh, so far, uh, Tyrion Lannister is a very interesting... Oh, I'm sorry. Our nameless geek <laughs> is a very, very yeah. interesting and well-realized character. Yeah. Uh, he has... Um, in in the middle, his, uh, his self-doubt got a little bit uh, too much, but the effect uh, Mr. Martin was trying to do I think is just to reflect his drunken state um, <clears throat> uh, coupled with his um, uh, lack of uh, self-confidence but all in all the character is believable his actions are his his uh, defection at the end and by the way I don't know if you guys uh, thought of this but the story uh, does remind me of literally defection by uh, Simak and uh, Avatar, uh, the movie by mm. James Cameron. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, his defection at the end is is completely understandable. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it came as a surprise. Um, to me, it's not the the twist wasn't quite nearly as uh, um, surprising to me because everything along the way had pointed to towards that direction. I would have I would have been very surprised if he had carried out the mission as uh, as ordered to. And I wonder throughout the entire. Because you see hints of you see hints of uh, uh, how he, the our geek uh, felt when he was transported into Antonin's uh, is that how you say it? Um, I don't know the Swedish name. Uh, 
into don't look at me <laughs> into <laughs> I well, I, I, i'm i'm looking into the camera you guys out there you listeners correct me i was my early joke <laughs> continue actually uh antonin when the gig was in antonin's body you could see he reveled in it because it was a much healthier uh, body than he was used to. And I'm, I remember thinking to myself when I was reading, like, just from that part, well, there's really no stopping him from... Uh, what's stopping him, sorry, what's stopping him from just inhabiting the body uh, for good? And I have the idea that <clears throat> the rest of the geek squad, shall we say, didn't so much as fail the mission as that they decided to go native. Exactly like uh, uh, the guy in Avatar did. The guy in Avatar, if mm. if we recall, was a cripple and then he was in a body that, that could walk and that was like, oh my God, I can walk. So why not, right? Yeah, <clears throat> but I think the... Uh, I did a little bit of digging, and apparently this story had a had a prototype. Um, I don't know if if what I read was true, but this was apparently a, a historical story written for a history class, which he which uh, George R. R. Martin later uh, uh, turned into this uh, uh, little tale. Uh, I don't know enough about European history at that particular area at that particular time, though. So, like, I don't even know if uh, Sverborg, which is the 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 castle that everyone was fighting over, actually existed or not. I didn't. I don't know if the Russians were at on the on the doorsteps of Sverborg. So I can't verify how true this is. Uh, but I thought it was whatever, however true it is, at least it felt really solid. The setting feels really solid, like it could really have happened, which I think is a high, strong point of uh, of uh, A Song of Ice and Fire um, 2. Uh, like it's the, the setting is very realistic, very uh, not realistic, not believable. The word I'm looking for is very detailed and well structured. <clears throat> and of course, uh, the geek is just about uh, the best dwarf, man. The best dwarf. I could tot- I could I I, I I totally see him as like the predecessor of uh, Tyrion Lannister, just like Carl was the predecessor of uh, of. Uh, uh, Conan. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, Tyrion hates his life as a dwarf, and it's like explored a lot, and he drinks a lot, and he goes into drunken stupors where he laments the life choices that he has made and f- was forced to make, right? They're very similar in a lot of manners, uh, except for, well, I mean, unless you believe some really, really crazy theories that are on Reddit about A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, Tyrion doesn't have any magic associated with him. As of yet. I mean, maybe in book six, he he actually becomes a dragon and starts killing people. Who knows? But, um, you know, at this very uh, very point, Tyrion does not seem to possess that power. Um, but something that something regarding powers that really fascinated me about the story is the way they did time traveling. So in both the uh, Defecta and Avatar, as you, as you uh, mentioned them, this uh, transpondence into the different body uh, happens in, pr- in the present, right? It happens like immediately. But what happens in this oh, story... In I, should, I, should also, I should also bring up another story that this reminded me of. Chucky, the John Wyndham story. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, Nikki. Uh, you know... You will pay. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, so, so um, the, the whole idea of having time travel to be a, a conscious effect rather than a physical one um, really fascinated me. I really like that idea. 
that it's not that the character is going back physically, but they get to mind meld, mind swap, mind intrude uh, to another to another person. That's how they can experience the past. And, you know, it supposedly at least attempts to fix the whole um, grandfather paradox. The idea that you could go back in time and kill somebody that, you know, is um, re required for you to exist. As you were talking, I, I am suddenly again reminded of uh, something. There's a 80s television series about a guy who time travels exactly in this manner to possess a uh, character within in different eras uh, trying to fix things sometimes he possessed the body of a man sometimes a woman sometimes I don't know who else he possesses but yeah I remember quite enjoying that uh, television series I wonder mm. if sorry yeah that's that's good stuff. Um, do you remember the name of this television series? No, no. <laughs> I want to All say right. Sliders, but Sliders is something that is completely different. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Right. Um, where was I? Oh yes. So, I think, looking at it from uh spoilers oh, for song oh, of ice I remember and fire now. i remember now. oh yeah what is it quantum leap quantum leap okay quantum yeah. leap. cool uh yeah so i think bran possesses exactly the same power that this guy does in the books i'm more than convinced because um right in book five right, spoilers again there's there's this whole sequence in bran three or or brand for maybe brand i can't remember in one of those chapters where he um he is being trained by um by the man in the tree right and he he goes into the weirdwood net and, and he speaks to his father you know he he, he calls him he's like ne you know like father other blah 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 and the and Ned Stark turns around at the tree and looks at it, and, you know, frowns as if he heard it, and then looks back. And then uh, the the mentor, you know, the yoga, the Yoda <laughs> for Bran, he's like, "Oh, it's impossible to to travel through time. You could only watch it." But I think the whole point is that Bran can time travel, right? And if you if you watch the TV show, uh, we have seen him time travel. Actually, he he is the one who who messed up Hodor, so that Hodor says Hodor, right? So, so somehow this story or elements of it are very much connected to A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, uh, and in both the fact that, number one, you know, Tyrion debuts in this story, and uh, second of all, uh, that the powers themselves seem to be what... Uh, you know, seem to be affecting the story of A Song of Ice and Fire. Now, if if that's the case, I mean, it's a very dangerous device, but it it has it was used in the TV show, and it kind of is shown in the in the last book. To me, it seems like Bran could be changing a lot of things or or making a lot of things happen that are leading to to the situation that happens in the story and uh, you know think the more i thought about it the more i wanted to talk to you guys not about the song of ice and fire because you know i don't know how much we can really talk about an unfinished work because we don't really know what brand's gonna do and so forth but i'm gonna be honest we... i don't think i've read the latest book either it's uh ah, okay i there have completely given up on uh, <laughs> that series <laughs> Fair enough. But what I did want to talk about is time travel. And time travel in stories, in TV shows, and movies. Um, you know, this seems like a perfect platform to jump off of. And how you personally feel about its use. You know, whether or not you believe that it should be used less or more. Um, 
how it should be used in some, you know, some aspects of when it was done well, uh, sometimes when it hasn't been done as well. Um, I'll start, obviously. I think uh, time travel is one of those things that if your story isn't based on it, if if it's not the entire crocus, it's not something that you're sort of trying to craft as carefully as possible, and it's just a secondary thought, you should try and avoid it. Uh, because, I mean, <clears throat> while uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, the third um, Harry Potter book, is really fun because of the time travel, every, you know, like, the fact that the writer literally had to uh, scribble in there in the fourth book that, all right, and now all of those time-traveling pieces, they've been destroyed <laughs> in the world so that this could never happen again. You know, you, you realize, like, yeah, if you introduce something like that, you've got to be real careful because every fifth comment you're going to get on your book afterwards, after that, you know, it's like, well, why didn't they use it in this instant? Yeah, well, why didn't, you know, like, and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a really slippery slope, let's put it like that, when you use time travel. At least that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll talk about when it's done well uh, in a you know, uh, a little bit later. But yeah, Robert, what do you think about time travel? I think that there's only one science fiction work I know that actually faces up to the difficulties and the possibilities of time travel, and that is The Fall of Chronopolis by Barrington Bailey. I, it, it addresses all the issues which other writers just skate over. For instance, uh, how do you know that history's been changed? Because obviously all your memories will get changed with it. So in a way, it's just the same as though it hasn't been changed, if you follow. Uh, well, in, in the um, chronotic empire, which Bailey describes, there's something called the achronal archives which are protected by enormous time buffers. He doesn't explain how the time buffers work, but at least he he has this uh, thing dangling up underneath the surface of the temporal substratum, called the strat for short, uh, which houses the achronal archives, which are the only source of knowledge of what things used to be like before the various reality changes occurred um and that sort of that sort of touch uh, there's loads and loads of touches like that in the book and also he makes you realize that there is a sort of momentum of time so that if you try in a ham-fisted fashion to change history you usually it it won't work the history just refuses to be changed it just carries on as though you hadn't done anything. So if you went back to murder your own grandfather, you'd still be, you'd still exist. It's just that you wouldn't have a grandfather anymore. Um, you'd exist, as it were, without a cause. And there's a whole fleet of time ships which had their existential uh, foundations deleted because somebody the enemy went back to when they were being built and prevent and destroyed the the thing that maintains them but they still exist for a few hours before fading away and that um, that is really a really eerie effect that there's a sort of momentum of time and you can change it but not it's not instantaneous so anyway that's what I think about time travel is that you get lots and lots of books which are great fun. But as for seriously considering the issues involved, the, the one I've mentioned is, is the only one I know of, the only one I've come across. Mm -hmm. what, what would you just, uh, would you say that's your favorite work regarding time travel or is there something else? I think it's my favourite, yes. I think it's because of the sense of awe and wonder that it evokes. It doesn't actually talk about changing the history that we know. The whole thing is, is happening far ahead in the, in the future. Uh, but, um, yeah, I would say it's, it's a mind-boggling achievement. What about you, actually? What uh, what kind of works of fiction do you enjoy that have uh, 
time travel in it? Um, my single biggest issue with uh, time travel stories is that um, most authors uh, introduce loopholes with their time traveling stories that they could either could not or didn't bother to uh, close up and <clears throat> because uh, time traveling usually opens up a whole can of worms that uh, mm. allows uh, the uh, the author to write whatever the whatever way he or she wants but usually it destroys the all of the the setting that had came previously just like the prisoner of Baskaban it might be fun but it's it introduces a lot of issues that happen that will happen in future books that even within the 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 book that is talking about uh time traveling itself um that is that becomes very challenging to resolve so mm. probably the best i haven't read chronop the the doom of chronopolis the fall of chronopolis but the first time traveling story i've read was the time machine is jewels and that was that was done uh in a way that completely avoided any karmic consequences from happening mm -hmm. at all because he traveled so far into so first of all the time traveler never traveled backwards he traveled forwards mm -hmm. he traveled all the way to the future so far into the future that only the the Eloy and the Morlocks Morlocks existed and then even further into the future when the sun has become bloated and is about to uh, swallow up the solar system so that is H.G. Wells, uh, that became more of a, <coughs> shall we say, travelogue kind of a story. He brings us, History Wells brings us into this place and then he talks about the, the places there and paints a very mm. nice picture for us. But that it has no uh, consequences at all. Just because he completely avoided going into the past, he was, he was completely in the future. <laughs> The, the, I'm struggling to think of a uh, story, uh, a work of fiction that did uh, time traveling well. And the only one I can think up of is Twelve Monkeys, the television series um, of uh, just uh, on short notice. Twelve Monkeys, the television series. Yeah, so there there was a movie called Twelve Monkeys uh, with uh, Brad Pitt in it, uh, and then the, uh, much later on there was a television series called Twelve Monkeys, but it has it has no re it has very little relationship to the movie itself. I thought Twelve Monkeys managed to tie up the loopholes that it generated itself with time traveling fairly decently and i'm qualifying my words because uh in, in such a manner because uh, uh i don't i honestly don't think uh it's it's uh I mean, it's so tricky to close off the loopholes that time traveling introduces yeah. but basically i think i think 12 monkeys the television series did as close to a decent job that I can think of on short notice. Yeah. So generally, I would avoid, I, I honestly like uh, Mickey. I, I would just tell every creative out there, don't, don't do time traveling. It's tricky to do, very hard. There's The Shadow Out of Time by H.P. Lovecraft, which is great fun um oh maybe we should cover that at some point mm. yeah well, a lot of things we should cover at some point i i, I stress <laughs> it's I kind mean, of a well, mo at this point uh yeah. yeah it's nice though to have uh it feels nice to have like uh 
It's like a it's like finding a treasure trove that never gets depleted, shall I say? I think that's something you could definitely say about works of fiction because even if we ran out of everything that came before 1990s, let's say, you know, we could still drag Robert kicking and screaming into the new era of short stories and make him, you know, suffer through the more and horrible writings and their ickiness, which would bring me endless pleasure. <laughs> wow. I want to say something about uh, um, the effects of frequent time travel uh, on the fabric of reality, because it just, just I don't know why, what uh, Nikki just said about modern stuff. There is Stephen King's book, 112263, about someone who tries to go back in time to save President Kennedy from being assassinated. And now here's a spoiler. He succeeds. Uh oh. His motive doesn't succeed. His motive was to prevent the Vietnam War and um, uh, Kennedy surviving does not pull out of Vietnam as he had hoped. Um, but anyway, uh, the um, uh, the idea in that, but there's a lot more to the book than that. And there's repeated uh, fiddlings with time as he as the protagonist realizes that he's not getting it right he fiddles again and again and and the fabric of reality is getting weaker and i forget exactly the details how stephen king conveys this idea but it's 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 pretty good it might have been his last good book i don't know i was and, sure you're gonna come up or you're gonna say his only good book <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't say that. No, I wouldn't say that. But uh, there's also Ben Elton, who's a, and here's another reassurance for Nikki that I do sometimes read modern writers. Ben Elton's a comedian, and I'm sure I know nothing of his efforts at comedy, but he's a surprisingly good science fiction writer, and he wrote a book called Time and time again i think about someone who tries to prevent the assassination of franz ferdinand at sarajevo thinking that he can thus prevent the world the great war, war. Mm -hmm. but again he sort of succeeds but he only succeeds in making things worse um there's another spoiler for you but uh, and that's uh, believe me that is a really good book and it's worth, i haven't really spoiled it because the the themes are not exactly how I'm saying. I'm just giving you one facet of the book. But there's this idea that if you do it too much, this time traveling, it's like some kind of environmental pollution, only it's continuum pollution, maybe. You're not meant to do it, or not, not a lot. So there we are. I think... I. It's um, it would not be a very fun uh, story if everything went according to plan of the of the person who's trying to change uh, the future by mm. meddling with the past. But I can conceive a story in which, um, let's say you have a very successful fantasy series or a sci-fi series or whatever, and if you're anyone like me. Uh, it's a very sad story and a lot of characters that uh, are beloved by by the readers will die. Uh, it might be a very fun exercise to do um, a not so gloomy time travel where actually you going back works, right? And you could have like uh, someone go through it in a very fun manner. Back to the future. Yeah, like back to the future. That's right. Um what I'm what I'm actually referring to is that there's like a there's a I wouldn't call them exactly cartoons that they're more like caricatures of ones on YouTube, uh, which concern the first uh, two or three seasons of Game of Thrones, and it's literally just the people who made the cartoon inserting themselves into situations where 
really horrible stuff happened and they don't happen anymore and it's all very like ah oh, look at this it's badass it's all cool right so for example robert a, a story you would understand like a a gag you would get because uh, you read the first uh, book in the song of ice and fire series during uh, ned stark's um you know execution that's the first thing that happens in this cartoon and they sort of appear out of nowhere from a from a portal and stop it and and uh, you know, like, let Ned go, but not only did they uh, let him go, they're like, all right, and now we kill Joffrey, and everyone's like, yeah, you know, and he gets executed and stuff like that, like, things that would never happen, but I think it would be, um, you know, if you go back to to your work uh, at some point, maybe one short story that you knew just had a very down ending, you could, you know, dress it up a little bit with, with fun time traveling and get a get a smile out of someone's face. Actually, here's my idea. Uh, if I ever get a collection of short stories printed out as, as a book and it will be sold in stores, every 10,000 copy will have one of the short stories with a different ending, where somebody just comes out of a portal and fixes it. And people will be like, no, my copy says this is literally what happens. And everyone will be like, you are just making it up. That's impossible. Wouldn't that be a really fun time, huh? Well, with self-publishing, you could do that quite easily. That's true. You? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The secret copy. Mm. <clears throat> well, uh, I think uh, Back to the Future is a very, just going back to, just putting it back to that movie. I just wanted mm. to say <laughs> that it actually was a very fun movie. And now, mm. come to think of it, it also, it is also, because the scope is so small, it does manage just to tie up nearly all of the loose ends that time traveling might open up yeah mm, yeah that's uh that's partly the way paul anderson sometimes gets away with his time patrol stories which are all about preventing changes from getting out of hand um though it, once it almost got gets out of hand because one time patrol employee is determined that carthage will win the punic wars and uh, in fact, he does. And the patrolmen get back and they, they don't recognize reality at all. It's totally different. And it's because Carthage has won. But they manage to go back again and refix it so that Rome wins after all. But uh, that was a, near, a close shave, you know, close shave. I think time traveling could, uh, as a device could uh, best be summed up as if it ain't broke don't fix it well it yeah except that it all is broke if if you take a dim view of history you think it's a, it's a total mess and you know just about anything would be better well i mean you can make it worse that's always the yeah, thing right make it, actually yeah all right so Human history is filled with horrible moments, right? Um, or, or with moments where the quote-unquote good guys, if you can even really have a good guy in a history which spans like 190 different nationalities and probably a thousand cultures within those nationality, uh, nationalities, right? But there's a lot of times where you're like, ah, oh, man, that dude who was honorable gets, gets really shafted in that moment. And if you went on trying to fix all of it, I think you just you 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 miss the point of human experience, I guess. Because it's like I don't know. It took me a very long time to understand that failing is part of succeeding, I guess. Right. So like, if you if you never fail, it me doesn't mean that you are fantastic. It means that you don't do anything. <laughs> Right? The only way you can be failing things is by is by doing stuff, right? Um and the only people who don't fail uh are those who are um you know who don't do any actions. And the same is true about our society. We have stumbled, you know, for thousands of years through the wrong things, but we you know, we're getting there, uh little by little. Um, I guess I'm an optimist. In my in my opinion, every single time we we have these setbacks, something uh, you know something else uh, gets put forward. That's that's great. Like for example, right now in Japan, they're doing test trials where they are 
thinking they will be able to grow teeth back. So no more fillings, no more fake teeth, like I've got these two right here. Uh, we'll, we'll just have real teeth that will just grow out of our mouths. And let's hope it doesn't turn out like the fly or, you know, any, mm. any, any alien um, um, thing, thing from the, from the thing. <laughs> That's the name of the movie, The Thing, uh, by John Carpenter. There's like three of those, but Joe Carpenter's one is the most gruesome. So, but yeah, I I mean, you know, time travel just seems so pessimistic to me. Like the only way we can make the today better is by going backwards. That just doesn't make any sense to me. It's like you know, you just gotta accept this this stuff happened, and now we gotta keep going and do something about it. Yeah, mm. that's mm. that's my message to the yeah. to the masses. <laughs> It's the, in a way, it's the Olaf Steppelden philosophy of uh, contemplation. You know, you you contemplate reality and you learn to appreciate the the shadows as well as the brightness. Well, you can't have something bright without uh, shadow. No. Sorry, go on. I can't, I can't help but think of this in terms of gaming. Life is an Iron Man campaign, and it's probably a good thing we can't save scum. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, if we did, it would be a very horrible world, I think. Mm. There's a, there's an episode of uh, Rick and Morty. Uh, Robert, don't watch it. Don't watch Rick and Morty. Uh, no. If you think that this is icky, oh God, wait until you watch Rick and Morty. You will, I mean, from one point of view, it does a lot of homages to sci-fi and it, it's really in love with the genre. So from that perspective, I think you'd be sitting there and catching every single thing that they're making fun of or, uh, you know, using, utilizing uh, all of the concepts that they use there. But from another point of view, it is the raunchiest uh, type of television show that you could imagine. It is modern day society in its splendor, completely unashamed of what it is. Um, if you want a lesser experience of what Rick and Morty is like, but still funny and enjoyable, watch Star Trek Lower Decks. All right, um, but anyway, so in Rick and Morty, there's an episode where Morty gets a button that he can go back in time and for 10 seconds, right? And he, so he meets this girl, and he tries to hit on her, and she's like, oh, you're gross. <laughs> so he goes back 10 seconds, and then he tries a different strategy, and so on and so forth. Um, anyways, he gets into a romance with her. They're almost married. It's all this, like, beautiful sequence. And then they get stuck on an airplane. And um, they fall uh, from the sky, and they're they're like in the mountains somewhere, dying. They're eating like some of the crew members, right? Like it's it's horrible, right? Like it's they they've run out of all the food, so now they have to eat human meat. And um, and he's like, "Oh, I love you. Everything's gonna be fine. We're gonna figure it out." And then he falls onto the button. Like, right after they get rescued and they reconcile with one another. And the button breaks, and now he goes back to the very first time he stopped time. And he comes over to her, and he's like, Oh my god, we're alive, everything is gonna be great, don't worry about it. Like, I had frostbite, I was, I was dying. And she's like, oh, who the hell are you, creep? <laughs> and she leaves him. So he's never gonna have this reality in which he's, he's gonna be, um, you know, he's gonna be with this, with this woman and be in love. Right, and I think it's kind of the that kind of message. Don't don't ever start with this uh, stuff, yeah, mm. otherwise you're gonna get heartbroken. Yes, so, it sounds like a it sounds like a a, a take on Groundhog Day actually. Mm, mm, mm. Groundhog yeah, yeah. Day Very is similar. another really good movie. Has a I. It's it's a very in it's very interesting. The device is very much. Um, sort of being stuck in a time loop but it is more about the 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 growing up of Bill Murray's character than anything else I gotta say it's very interesting mm. good movie but back to actually Under Siege <laughs> what well, is that what we're talking about Under, under who? who Siege what the title uh, Under Siege uh, it's uh, you know it has double meaning uh, right Number one being that 
the castle is under siege by the Russian forces, and the second being, you know, under siege in the future, in this dystopian future where they only have this one last time, one last moment to go back in time and, and fix it, right? Um, I I really like the fact that the story doesn't attempt to give you a pathos. Like, it doesn't try to say, like, okay, clearly these guys who are in the future, they're doing the right thing because they're trying to prevent something that horrible has transpired, um, right? And it's also not trying to say that they are the bad guys, right? They're just people who found a solution and they're trying the best to use it. But what I do find very fascinating is is probably the scene with... Ooh, what's, what's my what's my camera doing? There we go. Um, is when the um everybody goes and has fun right and gets gets to enjoy the one last time that they are going to be in this timeline right before they are all just wiped from existence that sort of revelry just seems like a pretty obvious thing to me that that nobody really ever uses um the idea that you know these people all of the support staff, they're just as doomed as everyone else, but we don't really hear about them. And the fact that they get this one big party before, before it just goes to, to smithereens is, you know, I think it's a really fun All element of the story. except that one guy that had to guard our geek. <laughs> well, and the, and the geek himself, right? Uh, who's just sitting there and being like, oh, I'm a Tyrion prototype, everything sucks. Um, you know. Robert... Do you have you ever read a a piece of writing where something was so obvious to you, like a scene to be done in in a situation such as this, but no one has ever done it before, and just like reading that for the first time and realizing like, holy moly, I never thought this could be on screen, and I don't know why. Well, there's there was Bob Shaw's invention of slow gloss in light of other days, which he expanded into a novel, which is mm. about uh, a glass that has the property of delaying light. So uh, you, with the pane of this glass, you see what was there a certain time ago instead of, you know, looking through it now. Um, and that changes society in radical ways because uh, well, for example, there's um, a murder case which would could theoretically be solved if people waited long enough to see what happened because there was some slow glass at the scene of the crime and the light will only get through it in sort of X number of years so people will be able to see. But the judge rules that you can't wait that long to... Uh, clear up a case on the evidence so he goes ahead and condemns the chap to to death it turns out he was right that it, it, he was the murderer but uh, it takes a big toll on him i don't know if i've explained myself correctly but anyway that was a, a genuine one-off sf um gadget or well discovery that that it's obvious when you read it, but it hasn't been done by anybody else. And now it can't be done by anybody else because Bob Shaw has has done it perfectly. Fair enough. All right. Um, well, what would you say your favorite uh, moment was in Under Siege? What was your favorite scene? I... Mm, I think, well, I'm, I'm being a bit of a spoil sport here, but the be very beginning and the very end are my two favourite bits. I like. I mean, the they're, all, they're always the choicest parts of any good short story, yeah, to be fair. Yeah. What, about, what about you, actually? What was your favourite scene? Probably the beginning. Uh, uh, up until the party. Uh, before before that, it was all it was very um, absorbing to me, and uh, like I said, Tyrion Lannister is a very good character. Hmm. I think my favorite um, has to be that whole gambit that the geek does from uh, Ronnie's instructions, where. 
uh, he sort of convinces this uh, other officer that Antonin is hearing voices from God. And he can tell him almost anything about his his plans and what he he's doing. I really love that scene. I think it was done yeah. really well. Where I was I was kind of watching it, and it it started from being completely unbelievable to me that this could be convincing to, you know, the writer um, guiding me to believing that this plan can actually work. It was it was really exciting. Mm. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, does anyone else have anything they'd like to say about uh, Under Siege? Any any closing thoughts before we give our scores? Nothing except to read it. Yeah, definitely. It You can, uh, once again, as I said, it's in uh, Dream Songs Volume 2. There's Volume 1, and th this is Volume 2. And uh, I would really recommend getting Volume 2 instead of, instead of uh, Volume 1 for several reasons. Uh, one of which is the fact that this... This uh, also contains um, the Hedge Knight, uh, which is a really really fun story. Um, the Glass Flower, the un uh, unsound variations is just as fun, um, and portraits of his children. They had really strong stories each uh, and all. And Dream Songs Volume One is really good as well. But I mean, the Hedge Knight and Under Siege alone uh, are just worth it. To, to read this. Um, mm. Yeah, Robert, any lasting thoughts before? Uh, any lasting thoughts? Any last thoughts uh, before? We, uh, uh, we get we're performing course. a good service on this podcast because we're warning uh, technicians to be cautious and sparing in their in their use of time travel. So, you know, if, if they take us seriously, we might save the universe a lot of trouble. Um, there's, I, I do there's, agree. Yeah. There's one with, uh, book I yeah. would recommend uh, to readers with strong stomachs, but you'll only you'll only want to read it once, and that is Calculated Risk by Charles Eric Main, which has more minds going back into the past and possessing people, but for entirely selfish reasons in the case of Calculated Risk. It's just the, the future is so terrible that people want to get away from it and take over the minds of people in the past. And it's brilliantly written, but it's, as I say, mind-bogglingly depressing. So I just read it once and that's it. All right. There you go. All right, so let's let's go into scores. Uh, I'm going to give this uh, story an 8 out of 10. Um, the reason I take away two points from it is... Uh, probably uh, because of how I I just wanted more, really. I wanted more from the story. I wanted there to be a bit more narrative in there. I wanted us to be in the past more. Uh, I guess this is kind of like a self-defeating point, uh, uh, you know, takeaway of points because I really did enjoy the story. Uh, I just wish it was longer. I think mm -hmm. it would benefit from from being longer. It's one of those rare moments where you read something and you think like, man, there was 10 more pages of this. I'd read 20 more pages. <laughs> you know, I'd reread it. Um, it's not as... And I also don't believe it's as strong as uh, uh, this Tower of Ashes. I think this Tower of Ashes was probably the best work by George R. Martin that I ever read um this is the one where he, there's the cat with spider legs robert if you if you if you are forgetting that one it, we we um reviewed it on the podcast it's about a guy in um uh, in a tower who ran away from his girlfriend because yeah, she got a new boyfriend I remember the mood of the story i remember the mood yeah. of it i just don't remember the details of the plot yeah 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 well, that one had a bigger effect on me than uh, mm. than Under Siege, but I still I still commend the author. It's it's a fantastic story, you know. Mm. <clears throat> uh, actually, what about you? What's your score? I give it an eight. Yeah. Ah. It's a Just thoroughly like... thoroughly enjoyable story. The middle section when uh, Tyrion gets uh, Maudlin and and all and drunk. 
that was uh, that dragged the story a little bit. It killed the pacing. I think. Uh, I could see the literary device that uh, <coughs> Mr. Martin tried to do with that though. So all in all, eight very enjoyable story. Hmm. And Robert. Just go. Um, I think I'll, I'll give it a seven point nine. All right, all right. Because uh, I would give it an eight, only I don't want to uh, f- sound like I'm just a sheep following the rest of the flock. And also, <laughs> um, but you could have given it an eight point one. Oh, that's true. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> I tell you what, we'll split the difference, and I'll give it an eight. Um... <laughs> This was like a classic, uh, you know, uh, Benny Hill uh, moment right here, the podcast. Very beautiful. Um, mm. Yeah, I guess we all agree on that this is a work, one of those works of fictions that you should read yourself to uh, get engrossed in it and enjoy it. Uh, dear listeners, thank you so much for coming to tonight's show. Please like and subscribe. Help the, uh, you know, the podcast grow. Send this to your grandmothers. And the grandfathers who might have read these stories, um, you know. Um, and of course, uh, tell us how to improve. Let us know what uh, kind of things we could do and what kind of stories we should cover next. Thank you for watching another episode of uh, Roll of a Tangent. Take care, guys, and don't get sick. Yeah. Bye bye. <laughs>